Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing on with Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson's PureFlix interview, which so far seems to be mostly him complaining that Secular News isn't interested in promoting his book. It might have to do with him being a young Earth creationist, sure, but it could also just be that lots of people write books, and most of them don't get to do interviews on mainstream news shows about their books. But this segment is called Answering Atheists, so you'd think they would address some points that atheists might bring up, right? So let's see where he goes from here. Darwin disproved the old creationist idea. He did not disprove the modern idea, which means we're on a level playing field again. Not having been disproved 160 years ago does not automatically place you on a level playing field. Evolution still flies in the face of creationism, and we know that evolution happens. So creationism has extra burden on its burden of proof. Not only do you have to falsify one of the most scientifically robust theories that we have, you then have to provide positive evidence in favor of creation. Because proving evolution wrong would not automatically mean that creation is right. It would only mean that evolution is wrong. So you've got quite the uphill battle ahead of you. And so all these evidences you find in textbooks, you find in popular books, those do not disprove creation, which means you can't use it in support of evolution. If you want to claim that all of the evidence in favor of evolution does not disprove creation, that doesn't mean that it no longer supports evolution. That just means that you have adjusted the creation model to include evolution, which I don't think you have. You're probably just going to make that annoying distinction between macro and micro evolution, ignoring the fact that the scientific definition of macro evolution is evolution above the species level, which you have already admitted is a real thing that happens. So when humans have set their minds to just mixing and matching males and females, taking the genetic diversity that already exists and producing bigger versions, smaller versions, long-haired, short-haired, red-colored, brown-haired, so forth, all of that just by reshuffling what exists. This is a frequent creationist claim, the idea that there is some predetermined amount of potential diversity contained within the genome, and evolution is just the expression of these different potential combinations. But genetic analysis shows that it's not simply a reshuffling of already existing genes. There are actual mutations involved. In dog genomes, for instance, there have been millions of single nucleotide polymorphisms involved in creating the different breeds. Single nucleotide polymorphism being geneticist talk for a point mutation. One single base pair in the DNA sequence getting swapped out for a different base pair. If all the variation was already contained within the original genome, there wouldn't be need for the SNP mutations to create different dog breeds. It would all have been there in the original genome. And that's just one type of mutation. There are insertions, duplications, and deletions as well. So we know that mutations in the genome increase the diversity of the group, but you claim that it was all just in the original genome. Do you have any data to back this up? Because dog genome sequencing has been a thing since the early 2000s, with scientists trying to minimize the genetic diseases that come from the inbreeding that happens in pursuit of the so-called purebred dogs. So there's a lot of data to work with. You'd think a creationist biologist would be able to be more specific than just a vague, all the diversity was contained in the original genome line. Because no one's going in there and microscopically changing the DNA with a pipette or with some, you know, some sort of <laughs> new technology. We're just taking what exists and picking the parents. No, nobody is going in and manually adjusting the DNA, and nobody is claiming that that's what's happening, but there have been millions of individual adjustments of the DNA through mutation. You're a biologist. You should know this. It is quite basic stuff. You go to the wild, there's less diversity. There's less variety in the wild than what we see on the farms. Yes, as would be expected. In the wild, if there's a new mutation, it doesn't have humans looking at it and thinking, oh, that's a cute looking thing, so let's actively search for another member of the species with a similar mutation in order to increase the chances of their offspring sharing that mutation, and then reproductively isolating their offspring from the rest of the gene pool that might eliminate that mutation through recombination, thereby artificially preserving it. So more diversity in an artificial setting makes perfect sense. There's a reason physical barriers are often a key ingredient in speciation. If you reproductively isolate a population, then mutations in the smaller population have a better chance at becoming fixed in the population. There is so much genetic evidence for 6,000 years that I don't even give it a second thought. Really? 
That's news to me, especially since molecular clock dating uses genetics to figure out when the species diversified, and has given us dates in the millions of years sometimes. Now, certainly, molecular clock dating has some issues and is nowhere near as reliable as radiometric dating, but the fact that molecular clock dating can even be attempted is itself good evidence for evolution. It relies on common ancestry and genetic relationships in order to work. So if we were not genetically related to the great apes, we wouldn't even be able to attempt it. So, for example, this is what many people don't realize, even evolutionists don't realize. We have in, our, in all of our cells, with few exceptions, DNA, and every generation, sperm and egg pass on DNA, the DNA changes. There's mistakes that happen. We live in an imperfect world. I really hope you're going somewhere else with this, because otherwise what you have just said amounts to a lot of people who accept evolution are unaware of mutations. The fact that mutations happen is like the most basic concept in evolutionary biology. You'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who accepts evolution but is unaware of this fact. It's not copied perfectly. Well, that means it's a, it's a regular process, and so to have a clock, all you need is a regular repeating process. Every generation, changes happen. Oh, so it's molecular clock dating that even a lot of evolutionists are unaware of. You may be right, but as I said, molecular clock dating relies on common ancestry in order to work. In fact, to get it to work, you need to first have a pretty well-established date for a speciation event in order to calibrate it. So when we use a molecular clock to figure out when humans migrated out of Africa, we first have to plug in the date of our divergence from the chimpanzee lineage in order to calibrate the clock. What's always fun about molecular clock dating is that there are actually a lot of issues with it, way more than any of the issues that creationists like to bring up for radiometric dating, but creationists usually don't like to poke too many holes in molecular clock dating because of that one article that used a faster than expected result for mitochondrial DNA mutation rates to calculate mitochondrial Eve's date at 6,000 years ago, right before explaining how that's not actually possible. But what creationists won't tell you is that even if that 6,000 year number was correct, it was arrived at based on the assumption of our common ancestor with chimps living about 6 to 7 million years ago. So in order for the 6,000 year number to be correct, creationism would have to be wrong. And over and over again what we see in our DNA is abundant evidence there isn't enough DNA differences for us to have been around hundreds of thousands, millions of years. It looks like we arose just 6,000 years ago. That depends entirely on how you calculate the neutral mutation rate. I'm fairly confident that he's referring to the article talking about mitochondrial Eve existing 6,000 years ago based on two studies that found an unusually high mutation rate, but it's worth mentioning that those studies are outliers. The measured mutation rate is generally about seven times slower than those two studies found. Now, I'm skipping a section where they both ramble on for a bit, so what he's addressing when we come back in is the claim that creationists don't make testable predictions. He said that creationism does make testable predictions, and then didn't provide any examples, and is now saying that evolution's predictions have been falsified, so it's the evolutionists that are moving the goalposts. It's a really plastic theory, and I can give examples of evolutionists from the 50s saying, well, we know evolution's been going on for millions of years, and so it's hopeless to find shared DNA among species. It's just been going on for too long. Mistakes have been happening too long. That's a prediction expectation of evolution. Okay, you say you can provide examples of that. I would be interested to see those examples. Were they the mainstream consensus? Was it one or two scientists going against the consensus? But here's the thing with that particular claim. Evolution predicted relatedness of species. How similar genetic material is, is a measurement of relatedness. So the issue there was not that evolution as a theory hinged on DNA being completely different in between different species. If anything, that sounds to me like a scientist hedging their bets, explaining preemptively that even if we find no relatedness in DNA, that doesn't falsify evolution, rather than them making the prediction that evolution actually would suggest no genetic similarities. But I'd really need to see the statements themselves in order to figure it out. Right now I'm just guessing. Realistically, it doesn't matter. You're starting with the assumption that their predictions about genetics were accurate. But that was before we discovered most of what we now know about genetics. You can pick any field of science that you like, and when you go back to that field's infancy, you'll find scientists making predictions that we now know are wrong, even though the overall field of science itself was right in one way or another. Suffice it to say that we have learned enough about genetics since then to know that those predictions themselves were wrong, not that those predictions prove evolution wrong. Well, we've just falsified evolution, haven't we? We've just found the opposite of what evolutions have expected. But did you hear how you phrased it to begin with? 
that it has been such a long period of time that we wouldn't expect any genetic similarities to have lasted through that time? In other words, the prediction was that there would have been genetic similarity at the beginning, but because they misunderstood the mechanisms of genetics and how mutations worked, they figured that all the genes would eventually completely mutate, leaving zero similarities between the species. That prediction, if it were ever made, has its basis in a misunderstanding of molecular genetics, which is entirely expected since molecular genetics were a brand new field of study in the 1950s. No, that's now the textbook evidence for common ancestry. Yes, because once a functional gene develops, if it is useful, then any future descendant with a broken copy of that gene will be at a disadvantage, providing a selection pressure that maintains that gene for longer than would be expected if selection pressures were removed and all genes were allowed to mutate freely. Some change that would either not affect function or would have only minimal effects would be expected, but the overall structure of the gene would be expected to be conserved over time. And as it turns out, if we map these genes and their changes, we end up constructing a phylogeny with a nice little nested hierarchy that fits evolution perfectly. Well, it's just it's a not theory, a scientific which idea. Is right. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a theory, essentially, of how you think something happened, right? Yeah. The fact that a Harvard graduate PhD biologist could listen to him say it's just a theory and then not immediately jump on it to correct the misconception that theory essentially means best guess is evidence that Jensen is not being entirely honest in his work as a creationist. Where should we look for the evidence for Adam and Eve? The creation evolution debate has been dominated by fossils, by geology, by all sorts of other fields of science, anatomy, embryology, everything but genetics. How can you possibly say that? Genetics is one of the best lines of evidence for evolution. Since the 1960s, scientists have been using protein sequence analysis as an indirect method of genetic sequencing, and have used these sequences to compare proteins among species, and have found that phylogenetic trees constructed with such methods match pretty much perfectly with the trees constructed using paleontological and anatomical data. So we've been using molecular genetics as evidence for evolution for as long as molecular genetics have been around, and we used Mendelian genetics as evidence for evolution before that. Every time the question comes up as to what someone thinks is the best evidence for evolution, the answer is almost invariably something to do with genetics. Whether that be phylogenies constructed with molecular genetics, the tracing of morphological traits to specific genetic mutations, the study of epigenetic factors and their role in evolution, the tracing of endogenous retroviruses, or one of the many, many other areas encompassed by the study of genetics, genetics are at the forefront of evolutionary studies. We have clocks in our DNA that go back 6,000 years that easily fit two people. It's kind of telling that he had to think about that for a second before adding on the two people line, because mitochondrial Eve might wind up looking kind of like she existed 6,000 years ago if you use mitochondrial DNA mutation rates from two outdated studies from the 90s. But to the best of my knowledge, Y chromosome Adam has never been placed anywhere near 6,000 years ago. Now, remember, mitochondrial Eve did not have to, and most likely did not, live at the same time as Y chromosome Adam. She's just the woman that is the most recent female common ancestor of all humans. Think of it in terms of step siblings. If a woman has a bunch of kids with one man, and then later has a bunch of kids with a different man, all of those children share the same female common ancestor in the mother, but not the father. So, mitochondrial Eve likely lived between 99,000 and 148,000 years ago, and Y chromosome Adam likely lived between 120,000 and 156,000 years ago. The astute among you may have noticed that neither of those date ranges include 6,000 years as an estimate. There are, of course, other estimates that use different methods of calculation based on the molecular clocks and came to different ranges, but I am unaware of any that came to the conclusion that Y chromosome Adam was only 6,000 years ago. Well, most people, evolutionists, assume every difference I have within my body, every difference between me and you, is ultimately the result of mistakes over time. No, they're the result of different alleles. Now, certainly a mutation can change how a particular allele is expressed, but I think most people understand that me being taller than both my parents is not necessarily due to a mutation. However, a mutation to the allele that controls height might make someone taller or shorter than they otherwise would have been, and then there would be selection pressure either favoring that mutation or disfavoring it, either suppressing it or enabling it spread through the population. 
It sounds to me like you just want to dismiss all of the genetic evidence that has come up since the 50s and 60s, and instead just rely on purely Mendelian genetics. And yet you sit there accusing evolutionary biologists of ignoring the genetic evidence. I think the best evidence, and to me theologically this makes more sense, God creates Adam and Eve with differences from the start, with the appearance of parents. And that's not deceptive, because God can create any which way he wants to. So, the best evidence for creation, in your opinion, is that God designed Adam and Eve with the appearance of already having mixed genetics from having genetic parents, thereby making it look like they weren't specially created, and it's not deceptive for God to create that way because God can do it however he wants? I mean, that's like saying that the coyote painting the rock wall to look like a tunnel is not the coyote being deceptive because he can paint that wall whichever way he wants. What if he wanted it to be deceptive? Because it sure does look deceptive if creation is more actually true. That's it for this one. He just goes into his testimony for the last question, and it's a boring one. He was raised as a young earth creationist, but because of the pressures to have a salvation moment that are placed on people in extreme religious traditions, he wasn't born again until he was an adult, yada yada. One interesting tidbit, though, is that apparently he used to do cancer research, but shifted, wanting to do something that was more active in the ministry. So he went from legitimately trying to help people to profiteering on miseducating people. What a career move that was. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Just Another Day in the Life, who says, Where was that source on the development of the defense in about a year of multicellularity? Which I assume was just a misspelling of multicellularity. This was on Tuesday's video where I mentioned the algae experiment that showed the development of multicellularity as a stably heritable trait in response to predation. And when I mentioned it, I showed a picture of the thumbnail for my Evidence for Evolution video where I go into more detail on it, and I had a card linking to that video as well as a link to that video in the description. Sometimes I use myself as a source for things that I have covered numerous times in the past, but when I do so, I always make sure to link to the video where I originally provided a source to corroborate my claim. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, David Schinkel, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the genetics providing the evidence for my channel. If you'd like to be completely ignored by all scientists since the development of genetics according to Dr. Jeanson, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!